way back at the start of this journey, I began by discussing how abysmal the main heroine's introduction was. Right out of the gate, Rosemary is a loud, obnoxious, self-interested chapper mouth, forcing out the craptastic dialogue as fast as her tongue can twist. That's the first part. And then we have the alleged clumsiness, which applies on an on-off whenever it suits the plot basis. The protagonist is thoroughly unappealing, and part of her characterization is an outright falsehood. A perfect introduction to the rest of the show. Welcome to pain. I would assert that the first time a character struts to the stage is among the most important points of any story to get right. Characters are the window through which the audience views the fictional world, so from an author's point of view, this is the one element in your story you absolutely want your audience to be attached to. Characters are your babies, you created them, you want your audience to like them, you want to show them in a flattering light. A good introduction establishes key traits, personality, who they are and what they do, what are their passions, their troubles, or at the very least hints at these. You have plenty of time to deepen the characterization later on, but optimally, from the very beginning, there should be something fundamentally recognizable, something immediately appealing about the character, something that makes this particular character them. Character appeal can make or break the audience's entire investment in the story. You get only one chance for first impressions, so you better make it count. Always lead with strong material. A generally favorable direct method to grab the audience is to make the character themselves entertaining. They are charming, they are witty, they are fun to watch. Their interactions with the world and other characters are enjoyable, intrinsically, even disregarding the plot. Another obvious path towards character appeal is to burden them with some kind of relatable problem. Love, family, money troubles, a debilitating illness, a grave loss, grand dreams, stuff like that. Fundamentally human struggles. Humans are empathetic creatures. If we see someone in trouble, our first instinct is to wish them all the best. It's a quick and dirty way to garner investment from the audience. This show tries both of these methods, and as I have pointed out many, many, many times, it fails constantly and utterly. See, in order to create witty and funny characters, the author has to actually be witty and funny, Shocking, I know. And as for the troubles the characters face, all of them are nonsensical artificial drama that would resolve in an instant if only the characters actually did something about it. Never offer sympathy for stupidity. People like this don't deserve it. Now all of this character appeal stuff applies to the main character, obviously. They are the driving force of the story. But it also holds true to side characters as well as villains. In fact, many times the villain side of this equation can be even more important. After all, common wisdom states that the hero is only as impressive as the villain they face. Crafting a compelling antagonist, in terms of presence, motivation and palpable threat, is a key part in any fantasy adventure. Yes, we are finally at that point where the main plot of the show decides to start moving once more. Not exactly forward, more like wiggling in place. But in any case, the villains emerge from the shadows, ready to cause trouble. Leading the charge is Olive, minion of the bad guy faction, the elusive triumvirate, and the prime antagonist of the show. So, keeping in mind all that I mused a moment ago, Let's see about that introduction. Yes, Tell them that the elf girl and her minions are closing in on the secrets of witch country. One moment. The triumvirate says that you must vanish the elf girl and the others. Vanish? As in... Yes. 
kill them. I don't feel comfortable escalating things to that level with anyone. Oh, yeah. It's them or you. Choose. Okay, as far as introductions go, this isn't all too bad. It's woefully bland, but at least we got something in terms of characterization. Olive isn't fully on board the villainous agenda. She has reservations about outright murdering her enemies. That being the case, the reason why she is part of the villain faction in the first place is an immediate question. One that demands a compelling answer in order to complete the character. The rot is a potential threat to the entire world. People will perish because of it. The villains wish to keep this under wraps. That's the secret of which country, I assume. Why? Nobody knows. But the fact is that people are going to die anyway if the villains succeed in whatever it is they are doing. So why is Olive so against getting her own hands dirty? Is she forced to do this? Do the villains hold some power over her? A spell? A loved one as a hostage? Anything of the sort? Never explained. Okay, fine. She's evil just because. Lame and lazy. The usual cracks are already beginning to show. That aside for a wee moment. This is how episode 7 closes. And this is how episode 8 opens. These two scenes are delivered back to back. Olive, I hope you've summoned me with deadly results. Calm down, Smokeface. I have news for the Triumvirate. The girls have told no one. I don't think we need to kill them. They're not worth our time. <laughs> oh, Olive. We knew you'd balk, so let's make this simple. First, smash the elf girl's bottle of healing water. Next, corner the girls at the autumn processional. Turn them into stone. With this spell, you only get one shot. So, make sure they're all cornered together. And then, shatter them. them. Be quick. Be merciless. To die. 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 Dead. I don't want to kill them. I mean, I can. If I have to. Right, Kino? Don't be stupid, Olive. Unless you return to Witch Country with four handfuls of Guardian Gravel, the Triumvirate will finish you off without blinking. To die. Dead. <laughs> it's the exact same fucking scene. The same conversation, now with the added benefit of Willow Wisp over here spoon feeding Olive what to do and giving her a magical WMD so that there's no way she can fuck this up. One of these scenes is superfluous and should have been cut. Combine this entire convo to a single scene. Even when the main plot is finally at center stage, the pacing is still horrendous. But at least Olive's characterization is consistent, right? Right? WRONG! Okay, okay, I'll do it. But first, I'll do what I do best. Sow some discord. Might as well make it fun. So Olive doesn't want to kill anyone, but is okay with everyone ending up dead anyway at some point in the future. And she also takes glee from tormenting her enemies. Okay, enough of this. Olive is a horrendous character. Her motivations are at once non-existent and somehow still contradictory. She has no charisma, no threatening presence, barely any personality. She's supposedly a trickster type, morphing her villainous job into entertainment turning the heroes against each other, and cackling as they scramble around helplessly, except we never see any of that. She taunts the girls in their eventual encounter, but that's it. Basic villain banter. Very basic. Sage, new magic comes naturally to me. 
Unlike you. There's no sewing discord. Coincidentally, Sage and Rosemary are pissed at one another at the moment Olive makes her move, but that has nothing to do with her. The two are just mad because... reasons I'll go over in a while. Once again, what little characterization is offered is a bold-faced lie. You can't just say a character is a thing, you have to show them being that thing consistently. And just like everyone else in the show, she suffers from chronic plot-induced stupidity. Even when guaranteed victory is literally handed to her, she still manages to fail. Her ingenious plan to keep her paws clean is to deliver the girls to the main villains so that they can kill them instead. Which defeats the whole purpose, but fuck it. So she invites the girls to just come with her. Which is utterly retarded. Why would they ever follow her willingly? Especially since she declares herself and her masters as villains. How about being an actual trickster and lying to them? Tell the girls, Oh, I know these people who can help with the rot. You should totally come with me. The girls are absolutely stupid enough to buy it. Boom. Instant victory. Minimal work. Took me two seconds to come up with. So Olive's plan B is to use the ultra OP spell, which turns everyone in the city to stone, except Sage manages to shield the others from the spell, because there apparently are anti-magic measures in this world. Would be really useful as a security system for the school at a later point. For instance, imagine a barrier that automatically dissolves magical disguises, but I digress. The heroes managed to thwart the danger only because they saw it coming. Had Olive only done her casting in secret, she would have won. She is an utter moron. And then, instead of holding the city hostage unless the girls comply, I mean actually doing it, not just saying it, crush a few citizens to drive home the point, instead of being an actual villain, she lurks at some random alley, challenges Rosemary to a fight, and gets her stupid Neko Ninja ass handed to her by this first year bubblegum brain warrior wannabe. First encounter between the hero and the villain. And the villain loses. How can anyone contain their excitement amidst this high stakes frail ride? I have no idea. You know Darth Vader, the guy in the dark mask, glowy stick, Kinda cool voice, the most famous villain in all existence. You know what made him popular? Well, I can tell you that it wasn't because Luke beat him during their first encounter. This would have been a perfect opportunity to do a classic arc of fledgling hero gets beaten by the villain, has to train, and fares better on the second time around. Just have Rosemary survived the battle by the skin of her teeth, her friends come to rescue her, and then they all defeat the villain together. Motivated by her defeat, Rosemary trains like crazy, and the next time they meet, she can stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with Olive. Classic storytelling, for fuck's sake, the whole rival trope in media exists because it is generally a good idea to have someone around who is harder, better, faster, stronger than the main hero, the rival character acts as a tangible organic measurement of the hero's growth. It's clean and simple dramatic storytelling practically gift-wrapped for anyone to take advantage of. A world of obvious examples all around us. And still people refuse to follow what works. And after getting thoroughly beaten and humiliated, Olive's spell gets reversed. No consequences. Nothing is lost, nothing is gained, the villains had a certain victory within their grasp, and they failed because their minion is an idiot. You blew it! You had it all and you blew it! And instead of doing the obvious, getting rid of the useless pawn, and sending another minion to use the exact same spell again, the evil masterminds decide that one incompetent nincompoop isn't enough, so they pair Olive up with this walking piece of moldy ham sandwich. Mandrake is a joke. 
the lamest. Oh, look at me. I'm so evil. <laughs> Caricature of a human being you can imagine. What a cute little kitty. Can I break its neck? But this is about Olive. The sole reason for Mandrake's emergence is so that Olive can act all... Oh my goodness! You are murdering people! That's evil! How could you do something like that? Even though she herself is purposefully serving a trio of dipshits whose sole goal at this point in time is to murder people. What do you think is gonna happen if the villains win? You catnip sniffing absolute piece of shit! Characters like this are frustrating beyond comprehension. Olive is openly a villain furthering the Triumvirate's plans, acting as their spy at the academy, but she also has this holier-than-thou attitude when it comes to actually villainous acts. That's not conflict, that's not complexity, that's just hypocrisy plain and simple. Olive is no better than Mandrake, She's just too much of a wimp to do anything about the bully, so instead she decides to be a bully as well. That's the crux of Olive's character, she is a pathetic coward. But of course, the end goal of this entire contrived villain but not really routine is so that Olive can be redeemed. At the very end, she ends up turning on her former masters, foiling Mandrake's plans, and helps the girls to save the day. There are no consequences for this betrayal, so it begs the question, how come Olive didn't turn good ages ago? This is a mockery to the entire concept of character arc. Nothing about this follows any kind of cause and effect. Nothing about Olive's experiences has changed the way she views her situation, her place in the world, or the concept of right and wrong. This is hollow. We never should have given you that tuna. Mm. Yeah. Oh, but Fime gave her tuna. That changes everything. Actually, let's compile all the times anyone has interacted with Olive prior to her emergence as the villain back when she was still lurking around as a common house cat. Runes are read to predict future probabilities. They must be interpreted based on context. That's the wrong one. What? Your copy of runic lore and its implementations. That's the old edition. Here, use this one. Uh, we've tried everything. Flyers, a spatula, a shovel. Tridents, spells. The squirrely kid down the hall who picks locks. Intimidation tactics, hostage negotiation. Charms. Tickling. <laughs> Chompy, down, girl. Parsley. <laughs> You've got to get your cats under control. I thought they were your cats. Rosemary, have you seen my boar bristle brush? I've been using it to brush those two cats. I'm sorry. Don't be sorry. Their coats have been looking fantastic. <laughs> you want to be next, cat? <laughs> there is nothing meaningful here. If the show had bothered to actually show the girl spending any decent time with Olive, Playing with her, pampering her, maybe have a mini-adventure where the girls save Olive from a rampaging beast? Anything like that, then Olive's eventual conflict of allegiance would carry some weight. It wouldn't change all the rampant idiocy, or make up for the fact that Olive has no reason to be villainous in the first place, but it would at least establish a reason why she turns in the end. As it stands... Olive is one of the most disastrous villains I have ever had the displeasure of witnessing. She's not intelligent, she's a pathetic fighter, most of her magical prowess is borrowed. As an antagonist, there is absolutely nothing threatening nor compelling about her. Her characterization is a mess. She likes to be sneaky and subversive to defeat her enemies. 
except not really. She's a conflicted anti-villain, except she has no reason to be evil or good. She's basically Team Rocket, without the humorous irony. And the reason why Olive ends up so incompetent is clear. She cannot succeed in anything villainous. She can't severely hurt anyone. She absolutely cannot kill anyone. Because writing a redemption arc for an actual heinous person is an incredibly tough thing to do. It requires nuance, skill, effort, none of which the writers possess. They just want the payoff without putting in any of the work. Common mentality in modern writing. But she's based on the creator's cat, so that excuses everything. Can't have my fussy washy friend being a meanie now, can we? Then don't make your cat the villain, you miserable insipid twat! And as always, a massive thanks to each of you for listening till the end. The continued support is very much appreciated. And a special thanks goes to all the supporters on Patreon. As well as an extra special thanks to my 10 euro supporters, Wyland, Jesaja Vanderwatt, and Six Stars. If you would like to join these fine people, or check out any of my other creative stuff, all the links are down below. Take care everyone, and I'll see you all in the next one.